Hello, welcome and kumusta. Thank you for joining me. My name is How. I am your occupational therapist. In this episode, we will talk about the four aspects of clinical reasoning and we will be using that by looking into uh, some kind of a case scenario. So when you are doing some clinical reasoning, there are four things that you needed to weigh. There are actually four parts that I find to be very, very effective. Well, the first part of the clinical reasoning is the scientific merits of the case. And when you're talking about the scientific merits of the case, you are looking at the uh, the condition of the client. What are the scientific merits of this condition? Meaning, what's this condition? What is the nature of this condition? You look at the prognosis of this condition. And what are the functional implications of this condition? Is the condition deteriorating? Is the condition acute? What will be the functional implications for example, if somebody had a uh, fracture, you can tell that after a few weeks, then the person should not have a lot of functional impairment. Uh, they may not be allowed uh, to weight bear, for example. So it, this ability or the prescription or the order of the doctors in terms of the period of weight-bearing or the weight-bearing status is part of the scientific uh, reasoning. So it goes into the category of the scientific merits of the case. So if somebody came into the hospital and they had, for example, they had a stent put in their heart, so you know that the functional implication of having a stent is very, very minimum because you only have a venopuncture. So that's the scientific merits, guys. The other thing about the scientific merit of the case is you can actually consider the persons as an occupational therapist, you can consider their functional abilities as well. So that would be the scientific merits of this case. What are their current functional abilities? What was their previous functional ability as well what are the status of their performance components what is their cognition like what is their uh, the sensory motor status what is the movement status so all of these in the scientific merit so this is part a or this is one part that you would consider the second part that you need to weigh when you're doing some clinical decision making is the narrative reasoning. And the narrative meaning this is the life story of the patient. What is the social history? What are their values? What are their characters? What is it that they really want as a person? I would always think of it as the drama. What is the life drama? Not in a bad way, but what is really the story? Because when you look at the story of the patient's life or what they value, what they hold to be important, and this will have a huge factor on your ability to make decisions, and you will have to weigh this. A part of the narrative reasoning or the narrative merits of the case will be the person's interaction with family, for example. How the family is uh, involved in the case, how are they helping the case, or how are they limiting the case. Now that is the narrative merits of the case. The third merit of the case that will have a factor on your ability to make decisions or will be a, something that you'll need to juggle is this thing called pragmatic reasoning or the practical aspects of the job. And some of the pragmatic reasoning involves the location where you are, so the continuum of care, of practice. Where are you working? 
uh, an example, if you are working in a service that only does assessment, then that is the limit of your ability. That's the limits of your job. So you can only do the things that your job is allowing you to do. If the, uh, for example, you are in a hyper-acute unit where patients only stay with you for three days after stroke, for example, then that is the scope of your practice and that's the area of your practice and that is the time frame. If you are working in a rehab facility, then again, the time frame will depend on the allowable length of stay of patients. Sometimes you have up to six weeks. And if you are working in a district general hospital, for example, then your objective would be to get the person home as soon and as safe as possible. If you are working in a specialist unit, what they would call tertiary centers, or from my perspective, on a quaternary a continuum of care. You know, these are like spinal cord injury patients or spinal cord injury hospitals or specialist unit like burns unit or uh, what else, uh, cardiothoracic centers, for example, you know, specialist centers. Then you can only do the things that you are allowed to do based on the specialism and based on the, the, the nature or the specialism of your hospital. Okay, so if you're working in a, a, a heart and lung hospital, if there are other problems pertaining to heart and lungs, okay, that cannot be resolved quickly, then you need to pass on the responsibility and the accountability and the care to the district hospital or the district general hospital. Likewise, if, for example, the case is, you know, they, they came in, uh, patients come in because of a heart problem and the heart problem has been resolved, but they still have ongoing concerns, then they need to go outside of that facility. And sometimes the main factor here is that you just have to think that this person needed to leave or be transferred out. Regardless of where, as long as it's safe, then the person can go. And you're saying this because of the practical considerations or the pragmatic considerations. So that is the third aspect of uh, clinical reasoning. So one facet that you, uh, that you weigh your judgment against. And then the last part, is that of um, ethical reasoning. And this almost answers the question of, is it the right thing to do? So that's ethical reasoning. Is it the right thing to do? Is it moral? Is it right? As a human being, do we need to treat it or to treat the person in such a manner? Do we need to decline? Do we need to act? So this is more on the moral side. And this is the ethical reasoning. So there you go, guys. You have four aspects to start with. You have the scientific merits of the case. You have the narrative merits of the case. And you have the ethical merits of the case. And then you have the pragmatic merits of the case. Now we are going to look at a particular case scenario where we can actually apply this. And a scenario A is a therapist um, who's actually uh, seeing the person. And uh, this person has had a, uh, has a, a, a lung situation, you know, there, it, to a point that it's been bad that the palliative care team has been involved giving this person uh, a good few months to live, you know, possibly about six months to live. And when the occupational therapist went to see this person, uh, the person was actually requesting for a care package, somebody that will help her. Now, when this therapist assessed 
the patient, the patient was independent. And this was actually backed up by the fact that the nursing staff were saying that, yes, the person is independent in the unit. You know, the person is, is independent, she gets, she gets out of bed, goes to the toilet, has a wash. Okay. And now there becomes an issue now for the actual therapist because it, she felt that uh, she didn't need or she could not justify getting a carer for the patient when the patient was actually requesting for carers. So this is the case scenario now. So we have a person. So if we go and dissect it and we look at the case scenario now, let's dissect it on the, the clinical reasoning, on the facets of clinical reasoning. This person on the scientific merits of the case the condition is actually palliative in nature. So the condition is deteriorating, which means it's not going to get any better. And in the end, it will get worse. And along with that, getting worse, the prognosis, the functional implication for this is that this person will have a problem and will be dependent at some point. So that is the actual um, scientific aspect of this. Another aspect of the case is on the current situation, the person is was observed to be independent. The narrative merit of the case, this person, the patient, was actually living with some family members. The person doesn't have a husband, but is living with family, like, I, I don't know, perhaps a, a son or or a daughter. And they're raising their, their family, you know, so a young family as well. And the, merit, the, the narrative story is that this patient is actually wanting carers. That's, that's, their, that's, that's her story. She wanted carers. And she's complaining that, you know, the... You know, the daughter cannot help her. Okay, so that's the narrative story. And then on the pragmatic merits of the case, now the question is, do we need to get a carer for this patient? So the therapist in charge felt that there shouldn't be. That we cannot justify getting a carer when the person is independent. So that was the initial stance of the occupational therapist looking after the case. But if we look at it even more deeply, or if we dissect the case, so on the scientific merits, you can see that this condition is going to deteriorate. And there are moments where the condition would is fluctuating, so there will be times where, where the patient can be independent and there will be times where the patient cannot be independent. So the analysis of a person's ability in terms of independence may be on a one-off case or a one-off look or at an, at, an, at an instance when you look at it. It does look like the patient is independent. But if you have to consider the palliative nature of the case, you have to factor in that this person will eventually in the next few months if she's got only six months to live then this person is likely to deteriorate on which case she is likely to need carers well what you say what about the family can the family help you know and then you might say you know yes we might but then if you look now cross over to the narrative side of the story, you know, what's what's happening here is that the family is a young family, you know, the, 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 the daughter or the son that's living with the patient is a young family and they could not provide and sustain that help because they're raising a family as well. And the patient herself feels that she doesn't want to burden her children. So this is now the narrative story. So why do we need to factor this? Now, if you think about it, and I don't know whether I've mentioned it in my previous podcasts, 
the parameters of our assessment and intervention. You know, how we look at our assessment and intervention. We look at the merits of the independence. So that's good. So the therapist already saw that the person was independent. So perhaps she saw that there was no problem at all. But then you have to look. So independence is one. The other one is safety. Yes, there's no concern. The patient is still safe. The other parameter of assessment and intervention when you're looking at a case scenario in terms of their ADL abilities is the adequacy, the parameter of adequacy and quality. And if we explore this, the person and the patient, she may be independent, but what's happening is that she was saying that there are moments where it is difficult for her because of the breathlessness. So this now becomes the quality of performance. Okay, so there is a need now because we are able to establish that there is an issue with quality. Okay, so perhaps previously the patient was independent and then currently the patient is still independent but this time around there is a problem uh, in terms of engagement because she gets tired easily. There you go. So that's an aspect that just came out when you explore the narrative reasoning. So the the aspect of the aspect of the um, uh, the adequacy and the performance quality. And then if we look at it, and then the patient was actually asking for carers. You know, she feels in herself that she needed carers. Now, do we need to address this one? You know, you can, can you just ask? But if you consider as an occupational therapist, you have to factor in the patient's values, right? And if this is something that the person wanted and it is something that the person value, then surely it is something that we can consider. All right? So there you go. Now, based on this, now we've just been weighing the 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 question of do we need to provide carers? So we looked at the scientific merits of the case. Yes, the condition is deteriorating and it's likely that they will need. Okay. Do they need it now based on the merits of the the merits of um, of the scientific their independence? So probably not. But then when you look at the narrative aspect of the case, okay, um the um it, it it goes on the side that the person has difficulty when they're performing their ADLs. And when it's difficult, what can we do? Yeah, As therapists in terms of treatment, so if the problem is the person has difficulty with washing and dressing, the if you convert that, it's difficult, then the patient will... If you want to make a goal out of it, you convert that problem, the patient will be able to wash and dress with ease. Okay? Because it's not an issue of independence, isn't it? The patient is independent, yes. So you cannot aim for independence. But the problem is the patient is engaging in personal care, but with fleeting difficulty. So you cannot change that. If you change the goal, patient will be able to engage without difficulty. So again, that's something you can aim for in terms of where well, you've identified the problem of difficulty and so the solution would be to make it easy. Now, if you consider now, if you have to weigh now on your solution, how are you going to make it easy? Are you going to restore the problem? Are you going to resolve? Are you going to do ADL retraining? It's like, it doesn't look like you can do that, isn't it? Because with ADL retraining, you're just going to practice over and over and you cannot do that because again you have to weigh it on the scientific merits that the condition is deteriorating so the intervention will have to be a supportive intervention and a supportive intervention is putting carers in place yeah create and support the intervention now if you think about the pragmatic aspect of the case it is almost impractical. It is difficult, isn't it, for you 
to write down an extra report, start talking to social worker, requesting for carer when the person is independent. Then again, if you, yes, it's practical, it is cumbersome, it's extra work, extra effort for the therapist. But again, yes, it is work. But if you look for the scientific merits of the things, and then the narrative merits of the things, you know, that work, work is work. And therefore, ethically, we are now obliged to address the patient's needs by having the carers in place. Okay, and that's the story. This is how you weigh things. And what are the things? How did we factor this? What are the few things that we were factoring? And I keep on saying this, you know, to, to my students, to any clinicians that I come across with or any clinicians that I mentor. So the things that you factor are these. The facets of clinical reasoning, which is the scientific merits, the narrative merits, the ethical merits, and the pragmatic merits. That's one. Okay. Now, when you are looking, the other thing that you factor is your concern as occupational therapist. And again, your concern as occupational therapist is ADLs and their ability to engage on the day-to-day -day things and those things that are of value to them. Their preoccupations, if it occupies their mind, if it is a worry for them, then it is an occupational concern. So anything beyond medical concern that you cannot resolve, if there is a problem with coping, if there is a problem with living, if there is a problem with doing, if there is a problem with context of family, if there is a problem with the context of environment, then we need to address that. So that's our concern. So the facets of clinical reasoning, the, uh, the, the domain of concern of occupational therapy, you know, where do you come in? Okay. And the other one is the parameters of the assessment and intervention. And the parameters are when you're looking at the ADLs, you're looking not just at the level of independence, you look at the level of safety, you look at the level of quality and difficulty in engagement, and you look for the value of, you know, of the task for the patient. Okay, so that's that as well. Again, that's the parameter of assessment and intervention. And then what you also need to look at is the continuum of care, meaning, you know, where are you in terms of your work location? Are you in the primary care, which is the preventative? Are you in the secondary care, which would be general hospital? Are you tertiary care, rehab unit, in terms of community-based? Or are you inpatient rehab, which would have been, again, tertiary inpatient-based? Or are you in the quaternary care? Okay, let's see how this uh, uh, continuum of care would affect the person. If the person, if you are in the community, what would you do? Yes, you will still get the carers in place, isn't it? If you're an OT working there because you want to prevent, you want them to sustain being in the community, right? If you are in the district general hospital, I think, yes, you need to, as soon as they're medically optimized, if the patient would ha be happy to go home first and then have the carers afterwards, then that's an option. But then again, the patient would not want to go home. They wanted to have that reassurance and again, it's justifiable to have the carers in. So again, there you go, District General Hospital. If I was in the rehab unit, there's nothing to rehabilitate because the person is and will be deteriorating. So again, as soon as you have the support, then you can go home. So it's the same decision making. And if I was in the quaternary care, which if it was a specialist uh, hospital, um, I mean, it was a heart uh, it was a lung condition, so I would imagine that this person would have been perhaps in Brompton Hospital. Uh, and, and yeah, the heart is, is, is the, the lung condition is, is there, you know, is, is, is uh, deteriorating. So, 
Again, you cannot resolve it from a functional perspective. You want to prevent, you want to support. Again, it all ties up and the decision just remains the same in terms of discharge. This person needed to be discharged pending on medical clearance provided that there is a care support in place. Okay, now what about the follow-up? When this person goes home and what would be the follow-up that's required? Now, as much as possible, we want to keep the person at home as soon and as safe as possible. And we want as little interruption as possible. And while they're independent, as long as they are support and they're happy with that, then yes, we want to have a minimum input or minimum interruption or minimum involvement but we should be on a distant, you know, like a, uh, like standby assist or distant supervision or a distant support. And in the community for the, uh, the uh, support that is available for this patient would be the first port, port of call would either be the GP services, but the GP can't do it. So that's practical reasons, pragmatic. It'll be the district nurse. Okay, or a nurse in the community that's looking after the welfare of the patient and then they'll have constant checks. If there is a need for more services, then it will be instigated by them. Wow, there you go, guys. I think that is a thorough, complicated discussion. I hope you were with me on that one. Uh, it's uh, again uh, in, during this talk we had a talk about the uh, the facets of clinical reasoning. We looked at the case, we weighed the case on a particular issue about whether or not to get the carer for the patient, and in the end we weighed all of the factors on those four aspects of clinical reasoning. We looked at the parameters of assessment and intervention, and it's not just safety is also the adequacy and in terms of intervention we managed to identify that restorative intervention was not the option for this patient in fact the intervention that is required was a supportive one so we ended up on the uh, you know hopefully the appropriate intervention for the patient and this is the intervention was to have a carer coming in for the patient and bec and the reason why is because the, we have to factor in the narrative story. But just to let you know, this case can actually turn and can actually be different if, for example, the patient is independent and then the family is uh, supportive and they can look after the patient and the patient is happy to rely on their family, then this person can actually go home independently despite the difficulty and this person might have acknowledged that um, you know that she can get the help from her family and not having the reablement care or the social care to care to, to, to provide her care needs. So you see the decision making then obviously changed because you factored in what is valuable to the patient and how the patient sees the problem. Okay, and it's about seeing the problem and that's what we'll be talking about next time. So if you have any questions, guys, give me an email. I just wrote down a temporary one. So riot.conversations at gmail.com. Um, send me a message or, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about these things. Uh, I hope you learned a little something today. Just remember, anything you do matters and has an outcome. Until next time, bye!